Hello and welcome to the Patient Educators Update, where we talk about patient education in a clinical environment. I'm Chuck Jones, I'm with Synergy Broadcast, and I want to welcome our guest, Fran London. Hi, Fran. Hi, Chuck. Fran is the Patient Education Specialist at Phoenix Children's Hospital in Phoenix, Arizona, and she's also the author of the book, No Time to Teach, The Essence of Patient and Family Education in a Healthcare Environment. This book was voted the uh, Book of the Year in uh, 2010 by the American Journal of Nursing, and it is a practical guide to having effective patient education uh, results with your patient population. Um, and we normally take our topics out of Fran's book, but we're going to uh, move away from that this time. We're going to go for another article that we found. Uh, we're kind of on a roll with articles in the last couple of episodes. And uh, Fran, I, I don't have a, um, a title for this article. It didn't print properly, but I'm going to call it The Problem with Discharge Instructions. And as you know, we've talked about that in a couple of episodes, but this is, quote, new research. And the new research reveals that hospitals need clearer, well-designed discharge for older patients, noting that patient satisfaction with the discharge process doesn't indicate how well they actually understand. I don't think that's a surprise, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Who said it did? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, basically what they did is they talked to 400 patients age 65 and older, and they compared their conversations with what was written in their chart to see uh, basically, you know, what the patients understood. And uh, less than 60% marginally could accurately describe their diagnosis. And they also found that uh, the discharge instructions included 99 different reasons for hospitalization with over 26% that were not comprehensible to patients. The example they used was myocardial infarction instead of heart attack. Um, here's another uh, stunning statement. They discovered that the discharge process is often rushed and abrupt. <laughs> Said as many as 30% of patients had less than one day's warning um, that they were going to be discharged, and 40% didn't understand the reason why they were even admitted to the hospital in the first place, and that's also something we've talked about. Now, the most stunning thing to me out of this was uh, came from the recommendations, and after I mention this, I'll shut up and let you talk. But um, they, they recommended after doing this research that hospitals should establish a discharge team that includes geriatric specialists, advanced practices, nurses and pharmacists, um, and promote equal information sharing among physicians, the discharge team, the outpatient primary medical home, the home care provider, the patient and their family and caregivers and that hospitals should treat discharge as a transitional process, not an isolated event that begins with the decision to admit and continues throughout the hospital stay and post-discharge period. And I, I read that and I go, what, what does this mean in practical terms? What are they saying? If the average person that's on the medical side reading this, how do they know what to do? You know, it's creating another committee, if you will. <laughs> right. Why don't you boil this down for us? Well, I think the conclusion they came to is really just what we knew all along, which is that healthcare works better when you have the whole team working towards mm -hmm. the same goal, and the team includes all the healthcare providers caring for that patient in the hospital as well as the patient and family collaborating with them yep. and that discharge teaching starts at admission mm -hmm. and that every conversation basically moves information forward and you work towards discharge all the time with everybody involved um, and it's not one isolated incident at the end. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. If you remember the quote from the physician in Denver that he talked about the last 11 minutes is the worst time for patient education, and that's absolutely true because the patient is only thinking about going home, and if their family caregiver is there, they're only thinking about, oh, my, how am I going to take care of, you know, mom or dad or whatever when I get home. So they're not hearing anything. Um, that's why it has to start early 
so that at the end they actually learn stuff and they're more prepared. Yeah. And we've known this all along and we've we've always talked about starting teaching from admission and always talked about everybody talks to the patient about what's going on all the time. It it's not new, it's just that we're not doing it yet. Yeah. Uh and when you read articles like this, you think they're kind of overthinking it, aren't they? Especially when they start talking about forming this committee around discharge planning. Yeah. It it, sh- it just should be part of the integrated care. Yeah. I, I mean, I shudder to think the cost of getting all these people together in a room um, and, and talk about this stuff when it should be uh, something from the beginning where the nurse can begin doing an assessment, putting information in the patient record or chart, uh, making sure at bed shift change that this kind of stuff is transmitted to the next shift so that they can continue on. They can do their own assessments and evaluation and teaching and continue the process so that it builds over time. Well, they're already doing care rounds with the integrated team. So there's no reason why you can't always also talk about patient education and discharge planning and discharge teaching each time you talk with the rest of the team. Yeah, it, it makes total sense. You know, I've mentioned this to you before. One of the things that strikes me about a lot of these articles that we read is they're all fundamentally about patient education, but they never use the term. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they miss the point. Yeah, and as a result, they take these um, very high-level views, and there's no practical information that comes out of the research that I can see as a layman. Well, they don't tell you how to implement what it is they're suggesting. Yeah. They just say, well, we need more communication. Yeah. It's like, well, actually, how about having a conversation with the family? Yeah, it's amazing <laughs> what you what you can learn. And, uh, you know, if you use the old sale adage, you know, God gave us two ears and one mouth. That means we should listen twice as much as we talk. <laughs> and I think that's true in patient education, don't you? Oh, that's the key. Absolutely. I think part of it is that healthcare providers consider themselves to be experts and that they have more to say than they can gain from listening, not understanding that the only way to individualize that care is to know who the patient is. Yeah, there, there's no doubt about it because we know that the patient's going to have some baggage and that baggage may be fear, it may be uh, just a lack of understanding of why they're there and that was a, that was a big number, 40%. Uh, by the time of discharge, still didn't know why they were in the hospital. So that means they there was no conversation that discussed it. Or it wasn't very clear that yeah. they used words like my, myocardial infarction. Yeah. And that meant nothing to them, and they couldn't even repeat it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so there's, there's clear, clearly, a, a, easy for me to say, clearly a breakdown uh, in the process. Um, whether this starts at the top or at the grassroots level with the nurses, Somewhere along the way, we've got to get to the point where patient education is looked at as a common sense process that is relatively simple that involves two-way communication and shared information. You summarized it right there. (laughs) (laughs) Once again. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I do listen to what you say. It makes a lot of sense to me. And while I've never been on... Uh, the clinical side as a patient educator, I have done an awful lot of teaching and listening in my time and, and done some stints with both my wife and my mother in the hospital and been through some of these frustrating experiences where there is not a lot of listening. And that's exactly what it is. It's totally frustrating and and the patient satisfaction goes way down when that happens. Yeah, it really does uh, because we, we, we want to be uh, we want to be talked to, not talked at. Uh, we want to be considered a human, a person. Uh, and to me, you know, I told you the story about the time that my son had to have tubes put in his ears, and we were really concerned about that because it was surgery back then. This is 35 years ago. And when we went to the hospital, he was one of 40 other children that were going to have it done that day. And so we were basically just part of a process. Even though we were, as young parents, we were fairly well frightened of this whole thing, but we were just another time slot in the doctor's day. And so that's kind of how we were treated. And uh, we don't like that anymore. 
you know, we want to know a little bit more about what's going on and what the impact is. Uh, a uh, great quote is, uh, minor surgery is surgery that other people have, not, not what I have. <laughs> yeah, we really do need to remember that. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I don't know, um, I don't know what the answer is, but um, if, if we could get the nurses and the doctors to think about be more empathetic to the patient side, um, it, it, I think it would help this communication a great deal. And I don't think it has to take a lot more time I think it's more attitude and the way you actually implement what you do. Yeah, because if you read your book and pay attention to what's in your book, there is not a lot of time um, on any one topic because you talk about how to use it in kind of the process where you use assessment and then you teach and then you, you, you measure what do they know. And these are not one hour conversations. These are very quick conversations that uh, allow you to kind of move the process through and if your hospital has provided you with some good tools besides your brain where you've got some video and you've got some handouts and maybe some other things to go along with it uh, that you can do an awful lot of education during that time where the patient does understand it because it is personalized and it is for them and it didn't take you any time exactly yeah exactly. so another reason to buy your book <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, so I guess, you know, our summary on this is that the problem with discharge instructions is for the most part that researchers especially are overthinking it, and we're not looking at it in its basis form, which is communication. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, why don't you tell folks how they can find you online? Well, I've got a blog at www.notimetoteach, and I'm on Twitter at no Time to Teach. Okay, and they can also find your book wherever books are sold, obviously at Amazon. Uh, you can download it as an ebook, and you can also buy it as a paperback. And uh, for those that might want to use Fran's book in some in-service and group teaching, if you go to the publisher, Pritchett & Hull, their website is p-h.com. They will provide you with a sizable discount for a bulk purchase that uh, will save you some, some good money on that, and we rec recommend it. And if you want to add video and video on demand to your hospital's um, uh, teaching and patient education department, uh, Give us a call uh, at Synergy Broadcast, 800-601-6991, or go to our website, synergybroadcast.com, or Google MMDS, Medical Media Delivery System, and you can find out more. So, Fran, thanks so much for your time today. Uh, great topic, and if we can get people to think about this in a little bit more practical terms, I bet you we can move the needle. What do you think? <laughs> that would be so cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll talk to you next time. Okay, bye, Chad. Bye-bye.